Uh, I'm Rob Barnes. Uh, I'm a senior developer advocate here at HashiCorp, uh, primarily focused on the secure product line. Uh, and in the series of things that we've spoken about, so far we, we've covered a machine authentication authorization and the role, the key role that, that Vault plays uh, in that. Uh, we've just come off the back of speaking about machine to machine access and how we can control and govern which parts of our application stack are allowed to communicate with which other parts. Um, and now we are here to talk about human to machine access. Um, when we think about it, uh, as, as operators, as engineers, as developers, uh, there are always going to be those instances where something goes wrong and we're going to need access to a piece of infrastructure. We're going to need to SSH onto a VM. We're going to need to jump onto a database and, and run a series of, of queries and so on and so forth, right? Um, how do we do that? If we've got all of this infrastructure in a private network, uh, then me sitting at home working from home uh, from my laptop, how am I going to connect to that? I know in this room we've probably all run into that. Uh, let's look at this in more practical terms. And this is probably one of many approaches that you've used yourself over the years, right? So if you think about traditional session access, you probably from your machine either use something like a bastion or a jump box where you SSH into a VM or something like that. Uh, and that VM, uh, what makes it unique is it has a, uh, a public IP address, but it also sits on a private network. And by that very virtue, it has uh, network connectivity and access to everything that's in that private subnet. Right? Um, so you, you SSH onto this jump box, and from there you SSH onto another VM, or you make a, a, a Postgres command or something to a database, and so on and so forth. Um, and you know that's that's the approach that that we've we've taken. If you're not using bastions, you've probably used things like VPNs, for example, which creates a secure tunnel between your machine and your your private network. Right, it's all encrypted traffic. Um, but here's the thing: that the challenge that you have with that is, if we look at these two teams here, we have a front end team and we have a back end team. Right, the front end team is only supposed to be accessing infrastructure uh, related to the front end. They have no business accessing infrastructure with the back end. And vice versa for the backend team. Right? But the problem is, when they jump onto this Bastion host, they now have access to anything that's inside there. We have no way to really control that without putting in really complicated uh, routing rules. And you know, as we've discussed before, trying to even keep these routing tables up to date it becomes uh, a, a much bigger challenge, right? With the way things are changing. Right? So that, when we when we think about the, the role that Boundary is playing here, it's really trying to solve that challenge of how do, how do we provide us as humans access to our infrastructure in a very controlled, targeted, and governed way. How can we see what sessions have happened? Uh, how can we, uh, you know, control uh, which people can connect to which machines? Right. Now we're not talking about the whole authentication piece in terms of access and database. We're talking about network connectivity here. Right? So that's the first challenge. The second challenge, uh, as far as bastions go, anyway, um, is generally speaking. In my experience, anyway, I would have an SSH key from my laptop that's stored on that bastion, and that's known as SSH, just using that key to authenticate me, so on and so forth. Um, and I often joke that in some of the companies I've worked at in the past, I bet in this day and age, I probably still have access to some of their infrastructure <laughs> because they haven't gotten rid of my SSH keys. Right? Um, I'm not really quite sure why it's a really difficult problem for companies to solve, but the whole onboarding people onto that bastion is one problem. But taking people off of that bastion, removing these keys and so on and so forth is also another management overhead that's not linked into any kind of HR systems or any other database or anything like that of users. Um, so you now have this thing where we have almost secret sprawl again. We have SSH keys and we can't really be sure that only the people that have access to certain things on there actually are the ones that have access and there are no rogue actors. Right? So if we take a look at this diagram and then we shift to what a boundary approach looks like. It looks a little something like this, right? Boundary's architecture is it has uh, two components, right? It has a controller and it has a worker, right? Uh, the controller uh, is uh, the thing that you will log into, is the thing that you will interact with. It's the thing that controls everything. Uh, it's the thing that manages the access control element of it. And the worker's job is to do the heavy lifting in terms of creating sessions between the infrastructure and yourself, right? So 
it works in a, a similar way uh, to the Bastion in the sense that it also has a public IP address and it sits on a private network. But the thing is, as an end user, I don't connect to that and I can't connect to that. I'll make sure that I shut down SSH access and so on and so forth. Um, and even if I could SSH to it, it's only going to take commands from the controller. It's not going to take commands from me. Right? So that's the main difference. So everything I do has to go via this controller. Right? So if we look at the workflow and how this is going to operate, as a user, I need to authenticate to Boundary. Right? Now, we, we've talked about Vault, we've talked about uh, Console, and both of these have the concept of auth methods, how we can authenticate to these things. And Boundary is no different. right? We have, at the moment, uh, two primary um, auth methods. The first is user pass, which you saw an example of that with the Vault demo. Uh, and the second is OIDC, right? Uh, so with OIDC, we can bring our identity providers into Boundary without having to manually replicate our user database. Take Azure Active Directory, for example. We can set it up so that when I go to log into Boundary, it redirects me to Azure. I log into Azure, and then it will redirect me back to Boundary, and that's me authenticated. It's using Azure uh, as, the, as the identity server, right? So I've authenticated. Now, I need to request a session to a piece of infrastructure, right? So in this case, uh, I'm a member of the front-end team. I need to access front-end infrastructure. Right? So when we make that request, Boundary checks. It says, OK, we know who you are because you've authenticated using OIDC in this example, right? Um, but are you allowed to access that piece of information, that piece of infrastructure? And so what it will do is it will look at its its uh, its roles essentially, right? Uh, and our roles is uh, an access uh, control uh, uh, component of the domain model of Boundary. We'll, we'll look at that in a bit more detail. But essentially, it will check: is this individual authorized to create a session to that target piece of infrastructure? If the answer is yes, we're going to assume a happy path right now. Then the controller schedules the worker to create a session, right? So that, like I said, the worker is only going to listen to the controller. It's not going to listen to me. I can't go directly to the worker and say, hey, give me a session to this thing. It's not going to have it, right? It only listens to the controller, right? So once that's scheduled, then the worker creates a proxy between the user and the target. So my laptop is going to create a proxy from my laptop directly to the target piece of infrastructure, right? Um, and so the way that looks on my machine is I'm going to go to localhost and whatever port boundary tells me to go to, and that's going to give me the connectivity to my target piece of infrastructure. Right? Now, the, the thing that makes that really nice is, um, you know, not only do I have any annoying stuff to the, not have to deal with, like, you know, going onto jump boxes and your shell environment changes every time you jump to another piece of thing and maybe you're having to reload environment variables and so on and so forth. These things get really, really annoying, right? Um, I prefer just to go straight to whatever it is I, I need to get to, set it up the way I need to set it up, do whatever I have to do, and just get out of there, right? Um, but the thing is, this is now we have the controller, which is uh, orchestrating all of these things here. If you think about the security professionals in our organization, they now can get visibility on who's connected to what, right? When they were connected, how long they were connected for. They have all of these things here. Um, the Boundary team has done a fantastic job of, of adding very detailed login uh, to Boundary. So, uh, you know, all the logs that are output there can be ingested into their security system for them to do threat detection and analysis and look for patterns and so on and so forth. You can combine it with the rest of your security tools. And all of that is going on in the background as me as an end user doesn't know about any of that, don't care about that. All I know is these are my credentials to get into Azure. I use that to log into Boundary, and I want to connect to this piece of infrastructure, and I know I'm supposed to be doing that, so I can. The sad part here is if I request a session to something I'm not authorized to do, then you would, just as you would expect, get a permission denied. It just will not allow you to do that. Um, the way that the, the, the uh, uh, permissions work there is we can essentially almost do access-based enumeration, if you prefer. Um, so you can have it so that uh, only certain people are even authorized to even see a list of targets, let alone connect to them, right? Um, it just depends on what your security posture is. So if we kind of look at the access control kind of uh, domain model uh, a little bit more, uh, we have this concept of scopes, right? So the, the biggest scope is the global scope, right? 
So when you have your instance of boundary and you're the first person setting up everything for your organization, you are probably logging in to the global scope. Right? In that global scope, you can create organizations. Right? Uh, so this is an example of an engineering organization here. So we created an engineering organization which has its own very tightly scoped permissions around that. So you would log into that organization if you're a member of that team. You can have users inside there, uh, and, or you can use OIDC as, as mentioned before. Uh, and you can also set up groups as well. It, you know, it's not practical as your organization scale to assign permissions on a per user basis. You probably want to use a grouping approach, right? Um, but it begs the question, if I have all of my identities in an external identity provider, do I have to replicate that whole grouping structure in boundary? Originally, the answer to that was yes, but um, in more recent iterations of that, we've uh, come up with a feature which we call uh, managed groups, by which it will take the grouping structure of your identity provider and it will map that into boundary. So you can literally say, if I have a group called front end um, on my identity provider, you can create a group in boundary called front end, um, or you can just literally map that straight there. And any users that are members of that in your identity provider will be mapped straight into this. Then what you can do is you can assign your permissions uh, to uh, that group there, unless you want to do it per user, but it doesn't really scale very well. So in terms of the, the user infrastructure, you have users, you have groups, right? You can do that dynamically using external identity providers, or you can do it manually using the user pass auth method. And then we have projects, which is uh, kind of a sub scope of organization, right? So you can think about projects as a logical grouping of infrastructure, right? So as the front end team, there are a series of different pieces of infrastructure that are concerned with our components of the application stack. Uh, and that will be one project. As the back end team, we have our own projects, right? So if we have uh, infrastructure that is related to the work that we're doing, that will be in that project there. And we can assign permissions that are very tightly scoped to each project as well. So I can ensure that only members of the front end team can create sessions to the front end projects and so on and so forth. Now, I'll quickly flip to this slide before I show you a practical demo, right? Everything we've talked about um, is available as part of HashiCorp Cloud Platform, be it Vault, be it Console or Boundary, right? These are all managed versions. If you prefer to roll your own solutions, we do have uh, open source versions of all of these things here where you can download the binary, run it yourself. Uh, we, it's obviously community supported, but there's a wealth of information out there to help you employ the best practices. But the lowest barrier to actually by far is using HashiCorp Cloud Platform. And that is how I've set up the demo that I'm going to show you today. Right. We'll have a walkthrough. So I'll just switch my screens over. So with Boundary, is it context aware at all? Like, and, and what I mean by that is if you're, let's say you have, you know, again, a bunch of network nerds, right? So, you know, we've all, you know, a lot of us have experience with TACAX, you may have, Attack X server that supports logging, I get per command logging. I not only know who logged in, but I know what they did, what commands they ran. Um, does it is can Boundary do anything like that? So you're you're basically talking about a version of session recording. Is, is that basically what you're saying? So once you create a session, you want to know exactly what has happened in that session. Exactly. What, what did I do? So that's session recording, right? So currently, as things stand, we do not support that. Um, this has been a hot topic of conversation externally and internally as well. Um, whilst I can't commit to any timelines, I know that we are actively looking at developing that capability within the product. When you say hot topic, are there people who don't want it first? People love it. People, oh, okay. was, people love just, it. I was going to say, because on the networking side and in, in, inside of the structure of TACX, we've had accounting for like forever and I know what my you know we can figure so there, out. there are different there are different types of session recording which is why it's been the, the, the topic of a lot of debate in the community you have um, a session recording whereby uh, I'm trying to figure out the best way to say this it pretty much just records the session and if you ever needed to go back to a point in time you actually need a lot of resources to go through those recordings if you like right almost think of it like a video even though it's not as uh, in that kind of format uh, and you would need to look for certain things. And, it, you know, it's as a human who's uh, auditing those types of things that I get tired and, you know, I miss things, right? Um, so whilst it's the, probably the easiest way of implementing session recording, it has its drawbacks when you need to uh, look out for certain things. And then you have another, uh, another way of doing it, which is a bit more protocol aware, where it can actually decode actual um, commands and so on and so forth, right? 
And that is way more powerful because now you can start to implement logic. You can start to say things like, um, you know, uh, if these commands are run or something like that, let me know. Uh, it will flag up some kind of red flag in, in a security center or something like that, right? Uh, but it's very, very complicated to, to implement. So there's it, kind of a lot of debate in the community that uh, I've heard from users as to which they would prefer. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's from what I've heard, you know, I, I only speak to a small sample size of the community, um, but it's definitely a 50-50 split. But it's something that, that we, we uh, definitely do take seriously. It's um, one of the first things I thought of when I was told that we were going to be launching this product called Boundary. I was like, oh, session recording. They were like, not yet. Um, so Boundary is, uh, is coming on to uh, it's just over two years old now, I think. Um, so, you know, in the space of when we first launched it to where we are today, it has come a long way, leaps and bounds, um, and it will continue to grow. So just questions like this that you've just asked, which other community members are asking, are helping to shape the direction of the products. And I'm pretty confident that at some point in the future, you are going to see that capability in a very HashiCorp way of doing things. Question on the... Um authorization piece of things you mm -hmm. talked about it being you know user authenticates and mm -hmm. they get a list or they get authorized to connect to whatever mm -hmm. do you take anything else into account excuse me for example let's say they're they're logging in from a public wi-fi mm -hmm. maybe you don't want them to connect to certain systems in that scenario do you look at anything besides just the the user no we don't we don't have that capability it's interesting you say that. Uh, I, I gave a, a, dem a demonstration of this a few days ago, and a similar question, slightly different worded, was raised then. And you know, it's, it's probably like the fifth or sixth time I've heard about that. So again, these are the kind of questions that help yeah. us as a community kind of shape the direction of the product. Um, essentially, what you're saying is um, it's like uh, hardware compliance, right? It's like the, the question that was phrased to me before is, my laptop has to have these things installed mm -hmm. and so on and so forth in order to connect to these things here, which you know is very normal at, at enterprises that they have these compliance requirements, especially where it's regulated industries. How do we roll that into Boundary? Now, we don't have that functionality. I'm not really sure if there's a way that we can um, bundle Boundary with another solution that people are already using to do that type of thing there. It, it has a full API support. So potentially, yes, you can glue those things together but you would have to do it on a use case by use case example. What would be really cool is if we start to look at these things and if we see a common denominator there, then we can start to bring in support for those things. Um, but currently as things stand, um, truth is we just don't support that at the moment. I'm not right. quite sure if that's something we will support, but it's, com it's coming up more and more. I'm logged in as an admin user, right? So this, this is what we can see. So we're at the global scope and we can see in our global scope that we have two organizations. We have an organization called the marketing department we have an organization called the engineering department. Right? Um, if we go into the engineering department, we'll just have, kind of have a bit of a poke around and just kind of show you around what's what. So inside the engineering uh, organization, we have two projects. So if you remember, we talked about the different scopes, global organization project, right? That's the hierarchy, right? This organization contains two projects, the front end and back end, right? So if we look at front end, Front end contains everything concerned with the front end side of our application stack. So we'll have a look at targets, for example, and we have, I just called it front end. That's a target that we have. I'm sure in reality, as your organizations are really huge, you would have uh, hundreds maybe even of, of different targets, but this is just one VM that we have here called front end, right? And you can see here that there are no sessions uh, for anything in this project here targets and host catalogs right so we have host catalogs and host catalogs is just a catalog of hosts now what is a host right a host is the ip address of your target for example right so 10.0.1.101 right that's your host right um, the target is the port that you're going to connect to on that host right so that's the relationship between the hosts and the targets now i hear you say what if we have a series of, of targets that represent the same deployable unit? What if there's like an auto scaling group or something like that, or we have three nodes or something, uh, and you can connect to any one of those? Well, that we call a host set, right? So you can have hosts and you can have host sets. Like these hosts can belong to a host set. And essentially, you can say, I want to connect to one specific host, or I want to connect to any host in that host set. That's entirely up to you. So we have host catalogs, which contain hosts and or host sets. 
and you use a combination of those things uh, with target to connect to your infrastructure, right? Sessions are the things that we, we, we uh, call the connectivity between yourself and that. And this is uh, really neat actually, but we have this thing called credentials store. So this is where we can take this idea of session access management and take it to a whole new level, right? I want to SSH to a target VM, right? And I'm authorized to do so. So why SSH? Here's the thing, I need credentials, don't I? I need to, you know, if I don't have an SSH key on there, which is, as we've established, is a high management overhead, just storing SSH keys all here, there, and everywhere. Um, I'm going to need some kind of username and password. How do I get that? And you're probably thinking, oh, okay, we'll just log into Vault and we'll, we'll go and get some credentials from there. And yeah, you could do that. Um, but where you have boundary, there's no need to do that because what we can do is when we create a session, it can inject some credentials into that session for you. So you can literally say, I want a session to this target. What are the credentials for that? And it will spin it up. So me as an end user may not have permissions in Vault, for example, to get to that. But as long as I'm authorized to make a session to that target, I'm allowed to generate some credentials, right? Where, whether it's short-lived or whether it's long-lived, like we discussed with the key value store, right? Uh, that's entirely up to how we want to set these things up. So the idea is, as uh, end users, we probably don't even need access to Vault ever, really. We, we build our applications so that they can access Vault. But as, 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 a, as a user principle, if I need to get credentials from Vault, it's because I need to connect to a target piece of infrastructure. So I would do that via Boundary. I will let Boundary get, go and get those credentials for me when I create this session here. So we have the credential store. We've talked about hosts, host catalogs, host sets, host targets, uh, and we talked about sessions. We have groups, uh, which we, we talked about a little bit. I haven't actually set up any groups here. Uh, I've kind of done mine on a per user basis because it's just me. Um, and then we have roles, right? So roles is actually how we are going to define our access controls, right? What is it that uh, a, an entity is allowed to do? Are they allowed to view something? Are they allowed to create a session? Are they allowed to edit things? Are they allowed to update target information or host information? You know, it's very granular. You decide what it is, right? And we can create these roles. Uh, and within them, we have uh, things that we call grants, right? Uh, and grants are just grant strings, right? So here you can see that anyone with this role here can perform any type of uh, any type of read action against any type of, of uh, component within Boundary. They, all they can do is read. They can't write. They can't connect uh, to a, a target piece of infrastructure. That's all they can do. You would just literally just create all the grant strings and be as granular as you like. I've made this very simple to not make it too complicated for demonstration purposes. Right? And so, as a as a Boundary admin, this is what I can see. Right. Um, so I can see my projects, I can see all these things here. As an end user, how do I actually make these connections, right? How, how do I actually go about doing that? And there's a few different ways of doing that. So if we think about the interfaces that we have for Boundary, I've just showed you the web GUI, right? And this is mainly going to be for Boundary uh, administrators. Go ahead. So, OK, so what you saw was mostly Boundary administrators. When I'm connecting through Boundary to my end host, mm -hmm. I have my credentials that I be passed through to the end host if it's ex if the end device is expecting a username login and it doesn't username password login and it doesn't support SSH keys or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, so how you authenticate to that session there? So let's use SSH for example. Um, if the way that you need to authenticate that is username and password, well, you can just set up a a. So we have credential stores, right? Credential store is basically the communication between uh, this scope and a Vault instance, right? So um, that's just how do you connect to it? What is the namespace? What's the credentials that Boundary is going to use to do that? And you're setting up kind of a trust between the two, right? And then what you do is you set up credential libraries, which is a byproduct of credential stores. Um, and the credential libraries are associated with targets, right, essentially. So when you want to connect to a target, you can say that um, this is the, the path of a secret that I need to read in Vault in order to be able to successfully make this connection, right? So if it's username and password, you can use the KV example, if you like, which we're going to show in this demo, to read that information directly from Vault. Uh, or if it's uh, something dynamic, if that's how you, you've got things set up, you can use a dynamic secrets engine 
One thing I probably neglected to say in the Vault talk is everything is path-based because it's all based on APIs. If you think about when you make an API call, it's always going to be the, the host, the host name, the port, and then some kind of API path. When you look at the CLI commands, you follow pretty much the same paths and so on and so forth. So where your credential libraries are concerned, if we just click into this here, uh, let's go to credential stores and we'll click inside that and look at credential libraries. We have this credential library here. And it's basically saying in vault, I want you to read the credentials from this path where it says kvv2 forward slash data forward slash target creds. The type of call that it's gonna make is a get call, right? Not a post call. In some cases, you might need to make a post call. I think sometimes when you're, um, when you're using dynamic uh, uh, secrets engines, generally speaking, it's a post call that you have to make because it kind of creates credentials rather than reading credentials. So you just tell it uh, what the endpoint is in terms of just the path. You don't need the, the, uh, the connectivity information. And you just tell it what type of call it is, get or post, simple as that. And Boundary just does all the heavy listing for you. So essentially, when I create that session, it will tell me these are the credentials that you're going to use. Now, that's super nice when you're using dynamic credentials, because essentially, as an operator, as an engineer, I shouldn't really need to know the credentials, right? And yeah, you can say, well, you do know the credentials by way of creating the session. But if they're short-lived, then by the time I get to do any harm with it outside of the scope of Boundary, uh, it probably would have expired by then because the idea is that people can see when I've connected, they can see how long my session has lasted. And uh, if anyone's going to do anything malicious, they probably would want to do that unseen. Um, you, we have to remember with security, nothing is ever absolute. What we do is we put in place steps to mitigate the risks uh, and the risks that we deem to be the highest ones per organization. Right? Is there support for third party or external credential, you know, vaults? Uh, so not vault, basically something else or credential managers. Yeah. Um, currently, no. Um, I would imagine we would bring that support in. Obviously, we are HashiCorp. Vault is is our our identity broker and secrets management platform. So we prioritize that. Um, and uh, I think most people are using that at the moment. Um, I would imagine that in future, at some point, we would actually start to look at um, what else are other people using and. You know, uh, how can we better support? Because I think one thing you probably notice across uh, all three products that we've shown today is we try to create an environment where you dictate your workflows. We don't want to say to you, you have to work in a certain way. And yeah, kind of at the moment, you kind of have to be using Vault to get this functionality. Um, but I can imagine it wouldn't stay that way for, for too much longer. But I can use Vault to go to another secrets manager to get to, I could have my secrets stored someplace else and proxy it through Vault. That doesn't, Unless you're brokering identity, like in the way that we talked about with the database, that functionality doesn't exist yet. That's a vault conversation. That yeah. part. Uh, it doesn't exist yet. Um, it's So before I joined HashiCorp, I was a consultant. I spent a, a long career going around from company to company, helping them implement HashiCorp vault in a way that works for their organizations. And I can tell you what you've just asked there is something that people have been screaming for a long time. <laughs> and what I can say to you is we hear you, man. We do. We really do. Um, <laughs> I've, I've already got all my secrets someplace else. Yeah, I yeah. Do not want to have to. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and it, and what you just described there is the very ethos of how we do things, right? It's, it's we're we're trying to be show as much empathy to our our community as possible. It's not right for you to have to move everything to this just to get this kind of value here. So we, we're always looking for ways to do that. Um, so whilst again, I'm not committing to anything in this conversation here. We hear you. We definitely hear you. Okay. And we'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Okay. Okay, cool. So we, we've had a look at uh, the, 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 the web GUI, uh, and I'm logged in here as the admin. Uh, the other ways that you can interface with uh, Boundary is you can use the CLI. So CLI, again, is built from the API upwards. If you can do it in, in the API, you can probably do it in the CLI as well. It's just an interface on top of that. And then the third way that you can, you can interact with um, Boundary is using a desktop client, right? Now, the key differences between all of these things here is the web UI, you can pretty much do anything with Boundary except create sessions. So as, as an end user, I'm not gonna go to this web GUI and start a session with a target piece of infrastructure. It's just not something that we've designed it to do, right? For me to do that, I would do that one of two ways. I would either use the CLI or I would use uh, the desktop client, right? And I, I'm gonna do my best to try and show you both ways of doing things. So if I kind of flip over, 
privacy. And here we have the Boundary Desktop Client. Now, I've already authenticated as a user uh, as part of the front-end team. My user is called front-end, uh, imaginative names, right? Now, the desktop client is primarily designed to create sessions, right? It's not designed to manage boundary in any way, shape, or form. I cannot create new targets. I cannot administer boundary in any way. All I can do is create sessions to my target. So as a front-end uh, engineer, as a, as a member of the front-end team, I am authorized to create sessions to this piece of infrastructure called front end. There are other pieces of infrastructure, but I cannot see them because I'm not authorized to see them. I'm not authorized to create sessions there. So in a way, that's almost access-based enumeration. So we have the sessions that, 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 so we have the targets that we're allowed to connect to. We also have sessions here. So if I click on this, there are no sessions because I haven't created any sessions recently. Right? Um, so I should be able to create a session to this front end piece of infrastructure. So if I hit connect, and this is what it's done. It's created this session for me. So it's telling me that I can connect to this target piece of infrastructure using this port on localhost, so port 55694. Right? But then where it gets really nice is I can now get some credentials from Vault. So it's already grabbed that for me. So if I look at the raw API output, you can see that in this output here, we have a data blob which contains a password and a username. Now, in this case here, I've just used the key value store in Vault. Um, it, it could easily have been a sequence engine for SSH or whatever it is, and, it, and we can use that to create the session. So let's, uh, let's give this uh, a little test drive, right? If I click that button to copy that, and I, let me just clear the screen. Oh. And I go SSH and what was the user again? The user was target admin, right? So if I do target admin at and then it's localhost. Now we just want to edit this port information. So if I just do dash P, that is now going to create an SSH session to my target piece of infrastructure. As you can see, I've never connected to this IP address before, so it's doing the whole uh, fingerprint SHA authentication. So we'll just say yes. And now it's asking me for the password. Again, we'll go back to boundary, and we'll grab that here. Just copy and paste that. And I'm in. So proxied from my local machine, this laptop here, to a VM which is in a private subnet which has no access to the internet whatsoever. And I've authenticated with the boundary controller. I've asked for the session. Boundary has scheduled the worker, and the worker has created this proxy uh, between my machine and that target piece of infrastructure. And it's injected credentials into that request so that I can literally just paste them into a uh, SSH command on my terminal. right? So that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing things is we can, uh, instead of going through this desktop um, client, we can also use the CLI to uh, create that connection directly. So we can say boundary connect, and we can even inject the protocol. We can even say we want to make that connection to uh, the target piece of infrastructure using SSH, right? And how we do that, I'll just kill this session, and you will see, maybe I shouldn't have done that because I wanted to show you something. But if we look here, you'll see that that session is still active, but I can, gosh, what I should have done is killed it from here because you would have seen it kill immediately, but it doesn't matter. But it's canceling that session, and then we come back in a while, it will show up as canceled, right? So if I were a security operator and I said that, hmm, okay, I can see that Rob has logged in and made a connection to that front end piece of infrastructure, but as far as I know, Rob is in Cuba on holiday at the moment, so who's using Rob's credentials? Um, well, there's a time to investigate that, but first you need to shut the door, right? So you just cancel that session, then you can go in and revoke Rob's permissions. Then you can figure out just exactly what's happening. Is Rob actually not enjoying his holiday and he's actually doing a little work from, from, from the beach in Cuba? Highly unlikely, but you know, um, it, it gives the visibility to our security teams and our compliance and governance teams to be able to enforce these things. And because everything is output in logs as well, you can ingest it into other systems and you can have all sorts of detection and so on and so forth so that you can try and take the heavy lifting away. Now, the other way you could do it, uh, and I can never remember the command, so I'm going to copy and paste it from a readme that I have. I'll just bring this down so I can see, 
is I need to, from the command line, I need to authenticate, right, to boundary, right? So let's just copy this command here. So essentially, what I'm doing is I'm saying boundary authenticate, right? And the auth method that I want to use is the password auth method, right? Remember I mentioned we have user pass as one auth method, and we have OIDC, right? Um, for demo purposes, I've just set up user pass. Um, and then we have an auth method ID. You can have several auth methods as part of your scope. Uh, so you can have user pass and OIDC coexisting if that's what you want. So essentially we're giving it an auth method ID and we're telling it the login name that we want to use. My login name is like a username and it's just front end in this case here, right? So if I run this, I hope the demo gods are with me. It should authenticate and put, pop this password in. Cool. So it's now authenticated. Just I'll just copy the next command so I can make this one a bit bigger so we can see exactly what's happened there. So here we are. You can see, oops. You can see that it's authenticated the session. This is the auth method ID. This is when it's created a token as well. Um, this is something that happens under the hood that you don't really need to concern yourself with when you authenticate. It will just inject a session into uh, a token into your session. Um, and now we are in a position to try to make that connection to our target piece of infrastructure. So we've already done that using the desktop client and then coming over onto um, our terminal. Now we're bypassing the desktop client altogether. Uh, and we're just going to do boundary connect and we want to make an SSH connection. So it's already doing that protocol decoding for us. And uh, we're giving it the target ID and we're also telling it the username that we want to use as well, right? which we know that because we've got the credentials before. The way that you would do that if you don't know what the credentials are is you would just bypass that um, and it will give you the output and then you can literally just do it the way that I did it before. So if we do that, you can see it's created that session here. You can see that straight away it tells me that these are the credentials we've already logged in as target admin. Um, so we just need to copy and paste this password here. And I am in, right? And it's beautiful because, you know, as, as a user, I can, I, can, I can make connections directly from my laptop to my target piece of infrastructure. I can only connect to the things that I'm authorized to connect to. My company has complete visibility on everything that I'm doing. They have complete control in that sense where they can kill sessions. Um, and I don't have to worry about waking someone up to say, hey, can I, can I get access to this or can I get access to that? If it's part of my role, then the, the access control should already be set up for those things there. Um, and then there's the, the, the thing this does is it opens up a world of possibilities. Like I say, Boundary is API driven like all of our products are. Um, so you can start to do things like we've built a proof of concept uh, uh, tool within my team, which we're calling Rift. Uh, essentially, what we can do with this is we can say that as engineers, none of you have access to anything. You have no access. Right? And when we think about the principle of least privilege, um, th that's quite accurate. You don't need access to anything that um, you don't need in your day to day function. But that changes when an incident occurs. Right? When an incident occurs and you're woken up at three in the morning and you need to get onto a piece of infrastructure, what you're gonna to have to do, you're gonna to have to call someone, you're gonna to have to wake up your boss, you're gonna to have to wake up a security engineer and say, hey, can I have access to this? And they're gonna to have to answer that call. So that's assuming you can wake them up in time. You know, these, these are very annoying things as engineers. So what we've done is we've taken an event-driven approach, um, uh, which we're calling Rift. Um, and essentially what we do is we've uh, taken pager duty, just as, as an example, and alert manager is another one. And we've basically said that if I'm the on-call engineer and I get an alert and I acknowledge that alert on my phone, it then makes a call to Boundary to say, hey, Rob's on call, something has gone wrong, give him access to these pieces of infrastructure, right? And I can go and create my targets. And as you can see, the credentials are all injected into my session. So I don't worry about all of that. I just create that session there. When I've fixed everything, I have to hit resolve on, on my alerting app. If I don't, my manager is going to be onto me. But the moment I hit resolve, then it goes and revokes all of my permissions in Boundary. So this is the kind of possibilities that you have. This is just something that, that I've, I've, I've had this idea for years, but I just didn't know how to do it until Boundary came out. Right. Um, and now we've, we've done something like this. We're giving a lot of talks around these things here. So you can really start to expand your imagination and think, what is it that we can do? How do we give ourselves the most secure posture without stifling the productivity 
and the happiness of our developers. And I always say that a good uh, uh, developer experience is, is central to the success of the deployment of any security tool. So whilst everything is API driven, you just think whatever works for your organization and then you can go ahead and implement whatever it is that you want to do. If, if your organization is not comfortable with the idea of this being a traditional bastion host, mm -hmm. there's no reason this couldn't run entirely in, inside of your own network. And you just telling our users, you know, if you want to act, you know, the infrastructure only trusts the workers. Mm -hmm. And if you want to access any infrastructure, you, you may have to be, you may have to be already be VPN in, but you could say, okay, well, but still, you're still going to have to go through boundary to ask for permission uh, to access infrastructure. Let me make sure I understand the, the question, right? So I have to VPN into my private subnet, right? And then once I'm in, at that point, I want to use Boundary to make a connection to the target. Is that well, uh, again coming from a network-centric approach? All our gear has passwords of last resort, mm -hmm. right? And they're for us. They're stored in HashiVault, but I can't really stop an engineer from grabbing that if a box is misbehaving mm -hmm. and connecting to a box and saying, "Well, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do it as the password of last resort because uh, reasons, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be logged in as me when I do it. And I can't really." Stop that, or it's difficult. So is that is that like a doomsday scenario? This is like you said, last resort, right? Well, no, it's called the password of last resort, just because in theory, if AAA is down, yep. then you want what you want to use. But sometimes it just gets used because people are lazy, right? So if you were only allowed to connect from SS, if you were only allowed to connect from, I'm sorry, if all of my network devices are set up with an access list that only permits SSH inbound connections from a boundary worker. Mm -hmm then I can't really stop users from using the password of last resort. But if they have to go through boundary to do it, then I at least can match and go, OK, so someone logged into this device at this time using the password of last resort, using, using that credential. But they came from boundary. So I know who authenticated the boundary at that time. Correct. And I'm saying that even, so even if they get nervous, even if security people get nervous about the idea of having this thing exposed to the public internet, mm -hmm. Even inside the internet, it could still harden some infrastructure because... Absolutely. You have to think about this, right? So as a security professional, we operate on this thing we call breadcrumbs, right? When something goes wrong, you look for these little breadcrumbs of information, right? And generally speaking, the answers to your questions normally don't come from a single source, right? So you take Vault, for example, that has a wealth of logs, right? And you can take a combination of those logs and a combination of boundary logs and a combination of whatever other target system logs they are to build that picture. It's rare that it comes from one source there. The point being is, yes, like this infrastructure is on a public internet. It has to be on a public internet because that's the way that the network connectivity operates, right? If you're going to put in those routing rules in place, like you said, at least you do have that there. But I guess, uh, where, where is this last uh, resort password still? Is it in a physical vault, is it? No, no, it's on HashiCorp. On HashiCorp Vault. So the, the way that I would do that is I would set permissions. This, this is the idea. As a user, I don't even want Vault permissions. I want boundary permissions, yeah? And only the permissions that I require to do my day-to-day -day function. If a fire starts, then escalate my permissions just for the duration of that fire. Once I put that fire out, revoke my permissions, right? I, I feel more, more comfortable as an engineer knowing I can't get accused of anything because I didn't have permissions for anything. And the only time I do have permissions is when I'm just doing my job, right? Um, so I look at Vault in that sense and say, well, we should just remove their, their permissions. In fact, they have to go through, through boundary. It's the only way. Well, no, but then at, at some point, you have to deploy the gear, right? Mm -hmm. You know, would you like to begin the initial configuration dialogue, which is also my favorite message, <laughs> um, just when I'm trolling people. But, you know, we have guys who are deploying new hardware all the time. Yeah. Right. They need they need access to the password all the time because that's kind of the, you know, that's part of the configuration. That's part of the configuration steps to sure. deploy it. So totally understood. Um, and essentially what we're getting at is you, you end up having to trust these people. Right. You have to, you have to trust that they're going to do the right things. But well, but what, I, what I've done, though, is I've at least made it so that just knowledge of the credential isn't enough, because when the device is put into production, exactly. you, can, you have to go through boundary to get it. Exactly. Even if you've memorized that password, I don't exactly. care anymore, exactly. because you're not going to be able to use it to do anything once the device is deployed. Exactly. Well, there's that angle. And then the other angle is this, is that's talking if, uh, about a static credential, right? So even if they've memorized it, that's the only way that's going to work, because it's something that's long lived. And if you've written it down somewhere, then you can attempt to do these things here. 
it gets even more complicated for anyone doing those things that if it's dynamic, right? Now, and I understand that it doesn't work for everyone, but if it's a dynamic credential, you memorize it all you want. By the time you go to do anything with that, it's probably going to be expired and it wouldn't work anyway. But nonetheless, you come through boundary, then what we've done is we've centralized our secrets management, we've centralized our session access controls, we've centralized our whole uh, service to service uh, identity. So you can even use things like console in the background to figure out what, what pieces of infrastructure can speak to what pieces of infrastructure. And if we need to connect to that, then we can configure the route in that way. So there's so many different things that you could do with that. The point is, when you have this central piece of, of, of governance around this, then uh, you, know, you can implement whatever controls you want. And it comes even more powerful with the login, I think. So yeah, I, I, I definitely do take your point. And I think it's something that security professionals can definitely look at with a great deal of confidence. Because essentially, what really is out there at the moment in terms of a workflow that, that is, is more secure than that is, is kind of what I would hit with. So question I've got, um, how is the gateway figuring out what the best worker to use is? Uh, don't know the answer to that question. That's, uh, uh, that's a boundary under the hood question. Okay. Um, it's a shame that I have Jeff Mitchell on the call. He's, he's the principal engineer. He would be able to delve into all of those details there. Boundary figures all that out for you. We don't configure that. Uh, there are the one thing I would say though is there are tags that you can associate, right? So um, that was actually the answer to the question. I just remember this part, right? <laughs> so essentially, what we can say is um, uh, we we can create workers with tags. So we can say um, front end, for example, as a tag, and we can tag targets as well. So we can say anytime you start a session. Uh, if it will look at the tags of that target and it will assign a worker that has matching tags, right? So you can control the flows of those things there. So I totally forgot about that. Okay. But yeah, you, well, you can control it in that sense. Well, just to back it up a little bit and explain where I'm coming from is mm -hmm. let's say you're, you're wanting to take a zero trust networking approach to all access. Yes. So you've got an on-premises resort resource, for example. So yes. you've got your gateway, it's got a worker working you know, on the gateway mm -hmm. for the internet. And then for your local LAN, you know, you've got 10 gig access to your servers and the like, so you've got beefier gateways yeah. to handle that kind of traffic. And you so, would prefer to use that, wouldn't you? So if I'm on the LAN, how is my gateway or how is my agent figuring out that it needs to talk to the LAN workers, yeah. not the WAN worker? It would be tagging. It would tag, tagging would definitely be your solution there. Okay. Um, and it will just, it will filter that through that. So it will choose a node that matches the tags there. And it's doing the tags based on where you are, what network you're coming from? It's doing the tags on whatever you want. So essentially, when you say the target, for example, okay, I think I see what you're saying. So if you're coming from a certain location, you want to use this. But if you're coming from a different location, you want to do that. I don't know the answer to that. What I can say is if you can predetermine these scenarios, then you can pre-configure tagging according to your connectivity strategy, right? Okay. If it's going to be a bit more dynamic, I, I honestly don't know the answer. I'd have to get back to you on that one. The tagging does sound intriguing, though. It, it may it actually is, it is really address powerful. an earlier question yeah. we had, too. Right. Um, uh, how does uh, HashiCorp, Vault, and Console, and, and Boundary um, work with uh, two-factor? Uh, does it integrate with uh, keys, authenticator apps, something else besides... Uh, Good question. Um, so, so we've recently, so multi-factor authentication in Vault, for example, uh, was an enterprise feature historically. We've, in uh, more recent iterations, actually open sourced that. Um, we, we understand the need that multi-factor authentication is, should be a standard, right? Um, and that's the type of thing that we're rolling out. In terms of the auth methods in the other uh, products, the boundary and console, well, we're using OIDC, for example, right? So I have multi-factor authentication on my Azure. So when it redirects me to Azure, I still need to go through Azure's multi-factor authentication in order for it to be able to pass the authentication token back to console or boundary. So completely does support that, and that's all out of the box, pretty much, uh, except with Vault, you have to configure it. 